So, ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. Uh, as a precaution, and as he has done already in the past, the Vice President is joining remotely via audio today, and uh, I, I, I just spoke to him so I know he's, he's with us here. So, today is the first time in 2021 that we gather for the press conference. And uh, I would like to start by extending to all of you uh, our best wishes for a happier, uh, a better, and a healthier year in 2021. This is uh, really the wish that I form for all of us. Uh, we are clearly still affected by the coronavirus and its variants. Uh, we are not holding a press conference uh, together physically. We are all distanced from each other, and probably more so in some countries. And uh, I hope, we all hope, uh, that it is going to change over the course of 2021. And on that page, I would like to express, on behalf of the ECB, not only our warm wishes, but also all our sympathy and our condolences uh, to those who have suffered as a result of COVID-19, to those who have uh, lost loved ones, uh, or whose loved, one, loved ones are, are still uh, suffering from this, uh, this virus. So, uh, we will now report uh, on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council, which was also attended by uh, Vice President Valdis Dombrovsky. The start of vaccination campaign across the Euro area is an important milestone in the resolution of the ongoing health crisis. Nonetheless, the pandemic continues to pose serious risks to public health and to the Euro area and global economies. The renewed surge in COVID-19 infections and the restrictive and prolonged containment measures imposed in many Euro area countries are disrupting economic activity. Activity in the manufacturing sector continues to hold up well, but services sector activity is being severely curbed, albeit to a lesser degree than during the first wave of the pandemic in early 2020. Output is likely to have contracted in the fourth quarter of 2020, and the intensification of the pandemic poses some downside risks to the short-term economic outlook. Infl inflation remains very low in the context of weak demand and significant slack in labour and product markets. Overall, the incoming data confirm our previous baseline assessment of a pronounced near-term impact of the pandemic on the economy and a protracted weakness in inflation. In this environment, ample monetary stimulus remains essential to preserve favourable financing conditions over the pandemic period for all sectors of the economy. By helping to reduce uncertainty and bolster confidence, this will encourage consumer spending and business investment, underpinning economic activity and safeguarding medium-term price stability. Meanwhile, uncertainty remains high, including relating to the dynamics of the pandemic and the speed of vaccination campaigns. We will also continue to monitor development in the exchange rate with regard to their possible implications for the medium-term inflation outlook. We continue to stand ready to adjust all of our instruments, as appropriate, to ensure that inflation moves towards our aim in a sustained manner, in line with our commitment to symmetry. Against this background, we decided to reconfirm our very accommodative monetary policy stance. First, the Governing Council decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We expect them to remain at their present or lower levels until we have seen the inflation outlook robustly converge to a level sufficiently close to but below 2% within our projection horizon. And such convergence has been consistently reflected in underlying inflation dynamics. Second, 
We will continue our purchases under the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Programme, PEP, with a total envelope of 1 trillion 850 billion euros. We will conduct net asset purchases under the PEP until at least the end of March 2022, and in any case, until the Governing Council judges that the coronavirus crisis phase is over. The purchases under the PEP will be conducted to preserve favourable financing conditions over the pandemic programme. Uh, period. We will purchase flexibly according to market conditions and with a view to preventing a tightening of financing conditions that is inconsistent with countering the downward impact of the pandemic on the projected path of inflation. In addition, the flexibility of purchases over time across asset classes and among jurisdictions will continue to support the smooth transmission of monetary policy. If favourable financing conditions can be maintained with asset purchase flows that do not exhaust the envelope over the net purchase horizon of the PEP, the envelope need not be used in full. Equally, the envelope can be recalibrated, if required, to maintain favourable financing conditions to help counter the negative pandemic shock to the path of inflation. We will continue to reinvest the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the PEP until at least the end of 2023. In any case, the future roll-off of the PEP portfolio will be managed to avoid interference with the appropriate monetary policy stance. Third, net purchases under our asset purchase programme will continue at a monthly pace of 20 billion euros. We continue to expect monthly net asset purchases under the APP to run for as long as necessary to reinforce the accommodative impact of our policy rate and to end shortly before we start raising the key ECB interest rates. We also intend to continue in reinvesting in full the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the APP for an extended period of time past the date when we start raising the key ECB interest rates, and in any case for as long as necessary to maintain favourable liquidity conditions and an ample degree of monetary accommodation. Finally, we will continue to provide ample liquidity through our refinancing operations, in particular our third series of targeted longer-term refinancing operations remains an attractive source of funding for banks, supporting bank lending to firms and households. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with the economic analysis. Following a sharp contraction in the first half of 2020, Euro area real GDP rebounded strongly and rose by 12.4% quarter on quarter in the third quarter, although remaining well below pre pandemic levels. Incoming economic data, surveys, and high frequency indicators suggest that the resurgence of the pandemic and the associated intensification of containment measures have likely led to a decline in activity in the fourth quarter of 2020 and are also expected to weigh on activity in the first quarter of this year. In sum, this is broadly in line with the latest baseline of the December 2020 macroeconomic projections. Economic developments continue to be uneven across sectors, with the services sector being more adversely affected by the new restrictions and social interaction and mobility than the industrial sector. Although fiscal policy measures are continuing to support households and firms, consumers remain cautious in the light of the pandemic and its impact on employment and earnings. Moreover, 
weaker corporate balance sheets and uncertainty about the economic outlook are still weighing on business investment. Looking ahead, the rollout of vaccines, which started in late December, allows for greater confidence in the resolution of the health crisis. However, it will take time until widespread immunity is achieved and further adverse developments related to the pandemic cannot be ruled out. Over the medium term, the recovery of the euro area economy should be supported by favourable financing conditions, an expansionary fiscal stance and a recovery in demand as containment measures are lifted and uncertainty recedes. Overall, the risks surrounding the euro area growth outlook remained tilted to the downside, but less pronounced. The news about the prospects for the global economy, the agreement on future EU-UK relations and the start of vaccination campaigns is encouraging. But the ongoing pandemic and its implications for economic and financial conditions continue to be sources of downside risks. Euro area annual inflation remain unchanged at minus 0.3% in December. On the basis of current energy price dynamics, headline inflation is likely to increase in the coming months, also supported by the end of the temporary VAT reduction in Germany. However, underlying price pressures are expected to remain subdued owing to weak demand, notably in the tourism and travel-related sectors, as well as to low wage pressures and the appreciation of the euro exchange rate. Once the impact of the pandemic fades, a recovery in demand, supported by accommodative fiscal and monetary policies, will put upward pressure on inflation over the medium term. Survey-based measures and market-based indicators of longer-term inflation expectations remain at low levels, although market-based indicators of inflation expectations have increased slightly. Turning to the monetary analysis, the annual growth rate of broad money, M3, increased to 11% in November 2020 from 10.5% in October, reflecting a continued increase in deposit holdings. Strong money growth continued to be supported by the ongoing asset purchases by the euro system, which remained the largest source of money creation. In the context of a still heightened preference for liquidity in the money holding sector, and a low opportunity cost of holding the most liquid forms of money, the narrow monetary aggregate M1 has remained the main contributor to broad money growth. Developments in loans to the private sector were characterized by moderate lending to non-financial corporations and resilient lending to households. The monthly lending flow to non-financial corporations remained very modest in November, continuing the pattern observed since the end of the summer. At the same time, the annual growth rate remained broadly unchanged at 6.9%, still reflecting the very strong increase in lending in the first half of the year. The annual growth rate of loans to households remained broadly stable at 3.1% in November, amid a sizable positive monthly flow. The new bank lending survey for the fourth quarter of 2020 reports a tightening of credit standards on loans to firms. This tightening was mainly driven by heightened risk perceptions among banks in a context of continued uncertainty about the economic recovery and concerns about borrower creditworthiness. Surveyed Bank also reported a fall in loan demand from firms in the fourth quarter. The survey also indicated a further increase 
in net demand from households for loans for house purchase in the fourth quarter, even though credit standards continued to tighten. Overall, our policy measures, together with the measures adopted by national governments and other European institutions, remain essential to support bank lending conditions and access to financing, in particular for those most affected by the pandemic. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed that an ample degree of monetary accommodation is necessary to support economic activity and the robust convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. Regarding fiscal policies, an ambitious and coordinated fiscal stance remains critical in view of the sharp contraction in the euro area economy. To this end, continued support from national fiscal policies is warranted given weak demand from firms and households relating to the worsening of the pandemic and the intensification of containment measures. At the same time, fiscal measures taken in response to the pandemic emergency should as much as possible remain targeted and temporary in nature. The three safety nets endorsed by the European Council for workers, businesses and governments provide important funding support. The Governing Council recognises the key role of the next generation EU package and stresses the importance of it becoming operational without delay. It calls on member states to accelerate the ratification process, to finalize their recovery and resilience plans promptly, and to deploy the funds for productive public spending, accompanying by, accompanied by productivity enhancing structural policies. This would allow the next generation EU programme to contribute to a faster, stronger and more uniform recovery and would increase economic resilience and the growth potential of member states' economies, thereby supporting the effectiveness of monetary policy in the euro area. Such structural policies are particularly important in addressing long-standing structural and institutional weaknesses and in accelerating the green and digital transitions. We are now ready to take uh, your questions and I'm delighted to introduce our new Director of Communication, uh, who many of you know, uh, Wolfgang Kreusel. Thank you, Madame Lagarde. And um, the first question goes to Annette Weisbach of CNBC. Annette, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, President Lagarde, I have a question regarding um, the favorable, favorable financing conditions. Um, you've been um, elaborating on a tightening of financial, financial conditions um, in your bank lending survey. So how concerned are you about that tightening? And if that tightening were to continue, would that mean that the financing conditions are no longer favorable? My second question is on the economy and the renewed lockdowns in major economies in, uh, in the Eurozone, um, whether this is affecting your economic outlook at all, because it doesn't really seem to in your, in your text, and also how concerned are you about the creation of zombie companies in that context? Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And uh, you actually give me a chance to reverse the order of your questions, because I, I would like to address the, the second part of your question, which had to do with the economic outlook, because I think that it, it in a way, determines uh, what was decided uh, today at our Monetary um, Policy Governing Council. And when you know, we look at the current economic situation, we are clearly seeing uh, mixed developments. And those mixed developments apply to countries, member states, that have been affected in different ways and to different degrees by the pandemic. So uh, if I was to sort of 
put in two categories the developments that we are seeing. You have the positive development and the not so positive developments. And as part as the, the positive, uh, I would certainly say, number one, the fact that uh, the vaccination campaign has now started. Now, albeit with some uh, uh, difficulty to begin with, uh, but it has now started. We have two vaccines approved and uh, probably a third one to come. But that's the first positive. I would say my second next positive uh, is that uh, an agreement was found between the EU and Brexit. And that clearly has to be taken into account, given that our December projection, uh, which was predicated on the same basis as the European Commission, assumed that there would be no agreement and that it would be a WTO uh, blunt agreement. Third positive the fact that European leaders have now reached complete agreement uh, and, and removed the last hurdles to the next generation EU issuance at the EU level. And that really provides uh, some certainty as to the fiscal stimulus that uh, will be coming in, in the, uh, the months and years to come. Uh, it's not completed and clearly the ratification process has to be completed for the own resources to be made available and to therefore uh, permit the, uh, the, the joint borrowing by the member states and then the uh, RRP, the recovery and uh, uh, resilience plans have to be submitted in due course as well. But it's, it's, it's a positive uh, that has now been confirmed. I would list as part of the positives as well, uh, the fact that in the euro area, uh, manufacturing is clearly on a recovery path, and when we look at the manufacturing uh, PMI, it's clearly in positive territory. And finally, um, particularly the day after the inauguration of the new US president, the uncertainty that related to the election of the Georgia senators that clearly uh, had an impact on the majority in the Senate was also removed. So that, that's, that would be my category of the positives. If I look now at the not so positive um, elements, clearly the pandemic has um, worsened in many countries. Lockdown, uh, lockdowns have been tightened and for some of them extended. And the new variants uh, from the UK, from South Africa, from Brazil uh, could uh, require some more stringent uh, measures going uh, forward. The incoming data suggests that uh, activity likely declined in the fourth quarter 2020, which will have a bearing on the first quarter of 2021. And, uh, you know, whether we look at uh, mobility data, whether we look at service PMI, whether we look at retail sales, those, those are numbers that have, have declined uh, in, in the last uh, quarter of 2020. In that context, um, inflation numbers remain uh, extremely uh, weak. Uh, we know that the December number is uh, minus 0.3. Uh, we also expect that the early uh, numbers in 2021 will turn uh, most likely positive for mechanical reasons that have to do with the, uh, the German VAT rate, that have to do with the energy prices. But, uh, you know, domestic pressure, domestic prices uh, will continue to um, be subdued uh, owing to weak demand, owing to uh, uh, labor market slack uh, and the euro exchange rate appreciation. So that, that's, that's the landscape against which uh, uh, we have decided, uh, you know, to reconfirm the monetary policy decisions that uh, was made in December. And um, we do that against a projection which was announced in December, which we will revisit for the next monetary policy meeting in March, but which we consider as still broadly valid uh, on the basis of the pluses and minuses that I have uh, mentioned uh, before. But all of that is clearly tilted to the downside. We still have a, a, a lot of uncertainty about you know, the current um, pandemic, about its development, about the lockdown measures, uh, the containments, their length, and our, our forecast, um, our projection from December, which we believe is still valid, was predicated on lockdown measures continuing uh, 
through the whole of the first quarter of 2021, and vaccination progressing very gradually. So this, these hypotheticals are, are, are being confirmed by what we see at the moment. But in the light of that, uh, what we have decided is to reconfirm our December uh, monetary policy uh, decisions. And you know, in doing so, we, 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 it's, it's a steady, um, very focused and very attentive to all development um, and, and ready to adjust, if necessary, uh, our pace of purchase. I'll come to that in a second but also ready to adjust and use all the instruments that we have available in the toolbox. So that's our, 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 our framework uh, at the moment. And I'll, I'll now zoom uh, into uh, the question that you asked about favorable financing conditions, because this is clearly um, the, the compass that we want to use that is clearly uh, anchored uh, onto uh, in inflation. And I'm, I'm just going to reread for you because to me that's, that's the, 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 the key sentence, if you will, that some of you I'm sure have identified. We say, purchases under the PEP will be conducted to preserve favorable financing conditions over the pandemic period. So over the pandemic period is at least until the end of March 2022, or any such time when the Governing Council considers that the pandemic uh, is uh, to continue. And clearly that means that we will be present in the markets until the end of March 2022, at least. The second sentence matters enormously as well. It says, we will purchase flexibly according to market conditions with a view to preventing a tightening of financing conditions that is inconsistent with countering the downward impact of the pandemic on the projected path of inflation. So favorable financing conditions is the compass, but the anchor is clearly the uh, projected path of inflation and the necessity to counter the downward path, the downward impact that pandemic has had on the inflation path. So how do we, how do we sort of, identify whether or not we're in the presence of favorable financing conditions. Well, I would say, first of all, that it is based on a, a holistic and multifaceted approach assessment, and it, it is intended for all sectors. So all sectors means um, household, SMEs, corporates, uh, sovereigns. And we look at the financing conditions and as a result of that, we look at the banking lending rates, we look at the credit conditions, we look at the, the yields, uh, yields on, of corporates, uh, yields of sovereigns, and, and, and it's, it's this composite approach and this multiple indicators uh, approach that we take into account to determine whether the financing conditions are favorable or not. But don't forget that that favorability is, is always assessed relative to inflation dynamics. So um, we have to decide whether the financing conditions are appropriate to return inflation to its pre-pandemic path. So those, those are really, I, I like to think in terms of this, this, this compass and the anchor, and the two of them interact in order to assess whether or not uh, we need to um, uh, adjust and calibrate uh, our uh, purchases over any period. Because don't forget that PEP, uh, as intended to preserve the financing conditions, is earmarked by flexibility. And that flexibility, you've heard me say before, it's flexibility along time sequences, flexibility in asset classes, flexibility in uh, uh, countries. And it has this dual function of stance and transmission as well. So all that remains unchanged and the flexibility is still, you know, the, uh, one of the, the, the key attributes of, uh, of, of our PEP. Thank you. The next question goes to Balaj Korani of uh, Reuters. Balaj, please. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, Madam President, um, coming back to this point about preserving the current financing conditions, I'm curious about your commitment uh, and how far it goes, because you know, Italy went through some political drama last week, um, but there was little to no market reaction, which was quite surprising. Uh, 
But this, of course, was self-inflicted. It's a domestic issue and no connection to the pandemic. So why is the ECB supporting a market in such a case? And is this, is this consistent with the, the parameters that you just uh, set in the previous question? My second question um, relates to yield curve control. Uh, Pablo Hernandez, the, cause, the, the president of the Bank of Spain, said this is something that the ECB should consider. Uh, what is your view uh, of such a proposal? And uh, what is your reply to analyst commentary that, in fact, the ECB is already doing de facto yield curve control uh, without saying so? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, on, you know, let, let me just again restate what we are doing, uh, which by definition will tell you what we're not doing. Uh, our aim is uh, to preserve favorable financing conditions in the euro area. Uh, and we want to do that because we believe that it will support consumer spending, it will support investment spending, and ultimately it will help achieve our uh, mandate of price stability. Uh, and as I said, our assessment of favorable financing conditions is not um, driven uh, by any single indicator. It is a holistic approach. It takes into account multiple indicators, and you know, bank lending is one, uh, credit conditions is one, uh, corporate yields is one, sovereign bond yields is one. And, and, and it's by combining all of those that we, we try to assess whether the financing conditions are favorable or not. Now, obviously, government bonds yields uh, play an important benchmark role for the pricing of credit in the economy. Uh, but at the moment, uh, we do not see uh, that development in, in any particular yields pose an issue for euro area wide uh, financing conditions. And that really, I think my, my answer actually tackles you two questions. Uh, we're not riveted to any particular yield. We take into account multiple indicators that relate to the financing uh, of the economy and, uh, and as I said, we believe that financing conditions are currently broadly favorable on the basis of that multifaceted holistic assessment that we do of those very uh, indicators that I have mentioned. Thank you. The next question goes to Christian Siedenbiedel of Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Christian, please. I have a question about Madame Lagarde. Christian, it's impossible to understand you. We can't, we can't hear you. Okay. Oh. People we are a little worried about what will happen to them with the digital euro. Can you encourage them? Why is the digital euro good for people like you and me? I'm, I'm very sorry, but I, I, we lost half of your question. So uh, I know it relates to the euro, and I know that it's about you and me, but th anything else was lost in the conversation. So c do you mind restating your question? We couldn't hear it. Yes, I, I try it. Many people are a little worried about what will happen to them with the digital euro. Can you encourage them? Why is the digital euro good for people like you and me? Hmm. Thank you. You know, the word I was missing in, in, uh, in your question was digital, which is clearly uh, the, the uh, critical one. Let me just preface what I will say now with the fact that if and when we have a digital euro, we will nonetheless always have banknotes. So I don't think that anybody th should think in terms of banknotes and coins as opposed to and in substitution of uh, digital euro. So the two uh, will, will, will coexist uh, and will continue to do so if and when uh, there is a digital euro. And I just want to uh, remind you where we are in that process. We have launched a, a, a consultation throughout Europe 
uh, on the 12th of October, which expired on the 12th of January, to which we had over 8,000 respondents, responses by multiple respondents, uh, which uh, have all addressed at least two uh, of the questions that were included in the questionnaire. So we have received a minefield of, um, a mine of information, which we are currently processing, which will give rise to a report that will be shared, that will be made public and available, because we want that process to be totally transparent. Uh, my colleague on the board, Fabio Panetta, has reported to the European Parliament on that particular matter, and he will report again, I'm sure, uh, when we have conclusions from that report. And it is only in the spring, probably in April, uh, that we will determine whether or not we decide to go ahead with the work that will need to be done. But there are lots of questions that have not been resolved and that will, when they are resolved, uh, determine the shape, uh, the, 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 the technology support, uh, the, the uh, uh, process by which uh, the uh, digital euro uh, will be uh, created. And I want to downplay any expectations that it is about to come. Uh, it, it will take a number of years. It is a complicated uh, issue. It's one that has to be resolved without uh, disrupting uh, the, uh, the, the current financial uh, scene, uh, nor jeopardizing the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the monetary policy transmission that we have currently. So, uh, and, and we have not yet either decided what the technology backbone uh, would be, ideally, in order to support that uh, uh, digital euro. But I would simply observe, in response to your question, that a digital currency, where it has been piloted, and there is only one which is clearly now launched in, in, a, in a very small country, but it is piloted on a fairly large scale in, in China, is of use and of service to all citizens. So it is not something that uh, is uh, good for the elite or is good for the young or is good for some versus others. If it is well done and if it is uh, well implemented, it would be of service to all citizens. But clearly we are not there. There are lots of issues that need to be addressed. Uh, we need to make sure that that is compatible with monetary policy, uh, with sovereignty, with proper transmission of uh, monetary policy. So it, it, it's clearly uh, a project that is fascinating for some, uh, that corresponds to a demand from citizens. I'll remind you that there are several countries, including, for instance, Sweden, outside the euro area, granted, or the Netherlands, where the use of uh, tangible currency is declining at a very, very fast pace. And that has been, as so many other things, that has been accelerated uh, by the, the pandemic. Thank you. The, the next question goes to Carolyn Locke of Bloomberg News. Carolyn, please. Hi, thank you very much. Um, President Lagarde, as you mentioned in your introductory statement just now, the latest bank lending survey suggested that credit standards tightened for loans to enterprises and households. Now, we're seeing that we have these extended lockdowns and a very slow start to vaccinations. And a key risk for the euro area is actually a wave of defaults hitting banks. So how is the ECB thinking about this with regard to the effectiveness of its Teltro program, given that these are supposed to encourage banks to lend, and at the same time that lending can expose them to bigger risks? And secondly, um, the account from your last meeting also showed that uh, some reservations were expressed about how much the Teltro borrowing allowance should be increased. So can you give us an idea of what the Governing Council's latest thinking is on uh, what limitations exist as to how much policy can or should be eased via Teltros and whether there's any concerns about see being seen as excessively subsidizing the banking system? Uh, thank you for your question on, uh, on Teltro, essentially. Let me remind you what, what, uh, what Teltro uh, is, Teltro, Teltro 3, uh, is, is intended for. It is intended to continue to support the uh, financing of the economy and the fueling of credit throughout all uh, segments of the economy, and in particular, of course, the, uh, the, the, the non-financial corporate sector. But it includes also um, you know, multiple uh, segments of, of lending. So um, 
it was constructed with a view to making financing available at sufficiently attractive uh, conditions that banks would be actually encouraged to respond to the demand that they would be getting from, uh, the, uh, from the, their clients, essentially. And when you look at the numbers of the, uh, the second quarter, and particularly the second Teltro 3, and the take up that we had at that time, which exceeded by far all the, uh, uh, the expectations, and even the following Teltro uh, uh, that was also in excess of what the, uh, the forecast expected, it is clear that it has encouraged uh, lending by banks. And when they are consulted, actually, when you look at the, BLA, the bank lending survey, this one and the previous one, all banks actually say, well, all banks, those that are surveyed, actually say generally that Teltro has actually helped them and encouraged them uh, to, uh, to provide lending to the economy. Now, clearly, at the same time, uh, banks have to be mindful of the economic circumstances. Banks have to be mindful of the particular situation of their respective clients. They have to appreciate what kind of moratoria will apply, what kind of guarantees there will be, and they need to do their risk assessment as they were reminded uh, by the supervisory side of the ECB most recently. So it's with that background that lending is available, but clearly uh, to be used um, under the responsibility of the banks that have to continue to do their proper risk assessment uh, in view of the financial stability risks that are out there. Now, we had a good discussion about the, uh, the, the, the expansion and extension, if you will, of Teltro at our December meeting, and we came to the conclusion that it should be extended over time, that we should have three new uh, issuance, and that the volume that banks could be allowed to borrow against would be moved from 50 to 55. And uh, that, that's, that's how we are proceeding. We are reconfirming those decisions, and we continue to remain obviously very attentive to the actual uh, lending. We observe, by the way, that uh, the lending rates are at uh, lowest levels uh, they've ever been, or pretty much uh, that 1.5 percent for corporates, 1.35 for households. It's, uh, it's uh, really favorable financing conditions by all, by all accounts. And certainly, Teltra has contributed to that as well. Thank you. The next question goes to Martin Arnold of the Financial Times. Martin, please. Martin, are you connected? Yes. Uh, I am. I hope so. Yes, you are. We hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Madame Lagarde, two questions quickly for you. One is on fiscal policy. The U.S. looks likely to launch a major stimulus under uh, President Biden. Um, but as things stand, most Eurozone countries are planning to reduce their fiscal stimulus this year. Do you think they need to do more? Second question, um, you've given us a little bit more of, um, of a feel for what you mean by favorable financing conditions, but do you think you need to define that more clearly, your reaction function, just as uh, the previous ECB president, Mario Draghi, did in, in his Amsterdam speech in 2014 and actually um, outline exactly how you would react under different circumstances? Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for your question. Concerning the, um, the, the, the fiscal um, stimulus, I would observe that um, both from a monetary point of view and from a fiscal point of view, it is necessary to continue to be accommodative. Uh, the situation is sufficiently uncertain uh, that fiscal need to be um, continued at the national and at the European level um, for, the, for, the, for the region to um, defeat the pandemic would be nice, but certainly to counter uh, the, the downward impact of the, of the pandemic on uh, the growth of the economy, obviously on prices and inflation. So we believe that fiscal has to be uh, continued. Uh, the probably um, 
slight qualification that we would have, which I think is also in the introductory statement, is that we certainly recommend that it be made as, as targeted as possible and, 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 and temporary, given that we all hope that uh, uh, thanks to those combined policies, we will see recovery uh, uh, during the course of 2021, probably second half more than, uh, more than first half, and then, and then continuing throughout 2022. But fiscal, um, fiscal policy has to continue being supportive uh, of, uh, of the economies. Let me also observe that uh, combining the national efforts that have been undertaken, um, both in terms of discretionary additional fiscal support and in terms of guarantees, which if you know, put together um, are in the range of 24% uh, 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 roughly of, of GDP. If you combine that plus the threefold uh, package that was approved initially in April, uh, of you know the SURE program, the ESM program, and the uh, EIB additional guarantee program for a total of 540 billion euros, and the combination of the uh, recovery and resilience um, fund and and the MMF, the um, the multiannual budget, uh, you arrive at at a global package which is significant, and. Your question actually uh, prompts me to once again reiterate the fact that uh, it needs to be rolled out. It has now been decided. It has been an extraordinary breakthrough uh, for the uh, Europeans at large that there is this joint borrowing. But it needs to be rolled out promptly. And hopefully, we will see the disbursement in the course of 21 in order to support uh, some of the uh, commitments that are made and some of the identified investments that are proposed by the countries. So it's a question of the ratification process for the own resources and a question of the uh, recovery and resilience plans, which have to be submitted as well. But on the fiscal front, I think that nationally and regionally, there is that joint effort, which is uh, significant which is there, for which there is a political will of 27 countries, uh, which is always a bit of a challenge, as opposed to when you have one fiscal authority and one single country, as is the case in the US. And on that page, I would really want to take this opportunity to wish my, my colleague and friend, uh, Jeanette Yellen, the very best in her endeavor uh, to lead uh, the US economy in the way that uh, she only can do it. Um, inclusively and, and very smartly. Um, your second question uh, had to do with, I forgot now, because I got carried away with this fiscal uh, aspect. Oh yeah, it was, you wanted to know whether I would deliver a speech in Amsterdam to describe precisely with great, a great level of details uh, what we mean by uh, uh, favorable financing conditions. Uh, I have no plan scheduled for the moment, but it is uh, pretty obvious that uh, we understand what the general principles of the determination of favorability of financing conditions are. And I have uh, indicated the reference to holistic, multiple indicators, all sectors, and the key anchoring of my um, favorable financing conditions uh, compass onto inflation and how it can be used in order to counter the negative impact that pandemic has had on our inflation path. So it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty clear what we want to achieve and how we will define those uh, finance, favorable financing conditions. But we will, we, will be, we will be assessing that on a regular basis. And uh, clearly, there will be a uh, there will be yet another assessment uh, that will take place in March, and obviously at the time when new projections will be available. So the anchor of inflation and, uh, and how it impacts on the compass of the financing conditions will be even more explicit. Thank you. Next question goes to Isabella Bufaki of Il Sole 24 Ore. Isabella, please ah. review. Yes, hello. Thank you very much for the opportunity. President Lagarde, I have two questions. The first question is on the PEP envelope. In statement, you clear that the envelope is not to be used in full, uh, but it can also be recalibrated. Uh, now, 
the fact that it cannot be used in full comes first. And I don't know, I see maybe a sign a bit hawkish. I could be mistaken, but can you specify why you um, included this uh, sentence on the envelope? And um, I have also um, a second question on <laughs> preserving the favorable financing conditions. And it, this is on uh, the uh, banks and uh, on the fragmentation that there can be this year with the rise of non-performing loans, how the governing council is concerned about it, if it is concerned about fragmentation. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go back to that same sentence, which, uh, you know, it's, uh, as you can imagine, it has been very carefully drafted and elaborated. And there's one word that I would uh, call your attention to, and it is the word equally. So that sentence, which is following the one that I read earlier, so I will not impose yet another reading, although I love to read. But this one says, if favorable financing conditions can be maintained with asset purchase flows that do not exhaust the envelope over the net purchase horizon of the PEP, comma, the envelope need not be used in full. Full stop. And that word's important. Equally, so what we signal with equally is it's a balancing act. If and I'll read the sentence. Equally, the envelope can be recalibrated if required to maintain favorable financing conditions to help counter the negative pandemic shock to the path of inflation. So I think it goes, it, it, I don't need to re-explain yet again. Uh, as I said, our, our compass, the driving uh, force is the favorable financing conditions. The anchor is the countering the downward impact on inflation, on our inflation path, the downward impact of the pandemic on inflation path. And if we determine that the financing conditions are favorable, then we are just. If, on the other hand, favor favorable financing conditions cannot be preserved as the pace of purchase has been decided, we will adjust upward. And if the envelope is not sufficient, then we will recalibrate the entire envelope. So I can't be clearer than that. It's really uh, identified with, with a, a very high degree of flexibility and the capacity to adjust, because we are prepared to adjust all our instruments, not just the pace of purchase. We're prepared to adjust all instruments. Nothing is off the table. Nothing is off the table. You had a second question, which I've lost. Now, here we go. Bank fragmentation. Um, <laughs> you know, our, our mandate is price stability in the euro area. So when, you, when I hear the word fragmentation, I think about monetary transmission throughout the whole of the euro area throughout the member states. And that is a driving, that is also a key uh, function. It's one of the two functions of PEP in particular under the extraordinary circumstances that we are going through. Non-performing loans, this is a matter that clearly uh, uh, belongs to the supervisory um, arm of the ECB, and as you know, Andrea Enria has been very explicit about non-performing loans. He's been very explicit about, about what the banks should do in order to recognize non-performing loans. He's been very explicit as well about uh, the uh, asset management companies uh, or company, uh, whether it's a combination of national levels and a holding at the European level or a European entity, and I will not venture in that particular field because it belongs to the supervisory side. And as you know, we have a division of labor here at the ECB. Thank you. The next question goes to Andres Stumpf of Expansion in Spain. Andres, please. Good afternoon, Madame Lagarde. I, I wanted to know uh, if you see the strengthening of the euro uh, more or less of a threat that it was in, on December. 
And uh, a second question, I was wondering if uh, you could give uh, market participants any advice on, know, on how to know whether the ECB is going to use the full PEP envelope or not, as, it, as I see this holistic and multi uh, approach a bit confusing. Thank you very much. Well, I'm really sorry that you see it as confusing because it's not intended to be confusing. So let me restate again. Uh, we have an envelope of 1 trillion 850 billion euros that is available that can be used flexibly depending on whether or not we reach our objective of preserving favorable financing conditions. Uh, if we don't need to use the whole envelope because the financing conditions will have remained favorable nonetheless, we will not use the entire envelope. If, on the other hand, we need more than the envelope because the favorable because the financing conditions have not been uh, favorable and preserved as such, then the envelope uh, will be reconsidered and recalibrated. So flexibility is the key word. The other point that I made earlier on is that we have not only expanded PEP back in December, we have extended PEP over the course of time. So until March 2022, you can expect the ECB to be present in the market. And, you know, it is not going to be linear. It is not going to be a fixed amount. So, yes, we will have to look carefully at the financing conditions. And those people in the market understand as well uh, when and how financing conditions can evolve and change. So it, it's, it's fairly, uh, uh, it's not as simplistic as the linear fixed amount, but it's also, uh, driven by the fact that we want to be able to maintain fin favorable financing conditions, because this, we believe that this will actually induce consumers to spend, investors to invest, and ultimately economy to fare better and inflation to go up towards our aim, therefore helping us deliver on our mandate of price stability. So I hope to have clarified a little bit for you uh, what you felt uh, was confusing and to have, I hope to have uh, removed a bit of that confusion. On the, um, on the strength of the euro, let me, let me just tell you that we are um, monitoring very carefully exchange rates, very carefully, because we know uh, that uh, exchange rate have uh, an impact on prices. And, uh, and clearly play a part in uh, our inflation forecast and what we can deliver with our monetary policy. So we are very attentive. And as I said earlier on, all instruments uh, can be adjusted and nothing is off the table. Thank you. And the last question goes to Tom Fairless of the Wall Street Journal. Tom, please. Hi. Thank, thanks very much for taking the question, President Lagarde. Um, the first, the first question was on the um, how you see the outlook for the first quarter of this year. Are you currently, given the the social restrictions, it seems quite clear are going to last until uh, Easter in, in a lot of countries. Are you expecting a uh, contraction? I mean, how how big do you expect the impact of these social restrictions to be? The second question. I'm sorry to, to press this point again, but I, it was about the this 1.85 trillion. Um, and, the, you know, the fact that you said in the opening statement, I, I see that it's an even-handed uh, statement, but the fact that you mentioned specifically that you might not use it or suggests there was some kind of discussion about that. Um, I mean, was, was there a feeling within the governing council that you were tilting one way or the other that actually you might not need to, to use the whole package because you're cautiously optimistic, for instance? Thank you. Well, I d Thank you. Um, I wish I was cautiously optimistic. Uh, I think I'm, I'm now getting old enough to, uh, to be realistic and, uh, and to observe uh, the development of a situation which is really hard to predict and really hard to forecast. I think what we are, what we are uh, observing uh, on a preliminary basis, because this will really be the, uh, the subject of our March uh, next monetary policy uh, governing council meeting, but what we're observing is a decline uh, in, in growth in Q4. And as we all know, when you have a decline in Q4, when you have negative numbers, negative numbers we will see. But uh, 
decline in Q4 will uh, uh, travel into Q1 and will also impact uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the economic uh, outcome for Q1, added to which, as you said, there are more containment measures, there are uh, in, in intensification of lockdowns. Now, lucky or not, but we had anticipated the continuation and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the lockdown measures that are currently in place, n n not to the curfew hour, uh, if you will, but, but certainly it was included in our, in our forecast. And, uh, and that leads us to conclude that our forecast uh, for 2021, around 4%, 3.9 if I recall, uh, is still broadly valid at this point in time. But short-term risk, tilted to the downside as well, no question about it, uncertainty in the air. So we, sh we shall see, but we don't have enough uh, clear, hard numbers yet uh, to revise uh, in, any, in, any, in any way. All I can tell you is that our forecast for 2021 is still holding uh, as we speak. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I hate to read yet again, so I won't do it, uh, fear of being accused of reading so much. Uh, but as, as we have discussed in December, we have expanded the volume of PEP from uh, 1.3 to 1.850. Uh, we have extended the duration because we believe that uh, because of the uh, contagion uh, current developments, because of the containment measures, uh, we believe that an, an extended period of time is warranted. And we have associated those two measures, expansion and extension, with a variable which is favorable financing conditions. This is what we strongly believe in. And we have hope uh, that favorable financing conditions will continue and will be sustainable uh, going forward. But we have to be prepared for all options, as a result of which we have identified that envelope, which is either not going to have to be used if we meet the requirement of the favorable financing conditions, or which will have to be increased, recalibrated, if more is needed in order to respond uh, to this uh, expectation of the favorable financing conditions. I can't tell you more than that. It's, it's a package. It came together uh, with Teltros, which was also increased in, in volumes and extended over time. Uh, it's, it comes on the back of a, a very, of very low uh, interest rates. So it's, it's a whole package which, if coupled with our forward guidance, uh, which is also very explicit, uh, forms our monetary policy at this point in time. Thank you. I think that concludes our press conference. See you around next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best to you and look after yourself.